Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of 575 Ounces. Joining me, of course, are the usual suspects, Jamie Alter, Nikhil Naz. And uh, joining our trio today, a very unfit trio, because we're talking about a very fit topic, a fitness-related topic, because cricket as we know it, especially as far as from an Indian angle, is uh, closer to starting now as to when it was when this lockdown was announced, uh, which means a lot of fitness uh, things come into the entire picture. How long will it take for you to get back into match fitness? A lot of the, of course... Uh, the medical staff and the fitness staff that are with the Indian cricket team have given out quotes. But uh, to give us more perspective on it, is someone who's been with the Indian cricket team in the past, who's been with the Rajasthan Royals franchise since 2008, currently till now. He is, of course, the head of uh, sports science for Go Sports Foundation, former physiotherapist, head physiotherapist of the Indian team, currently with the Rajasthan Royals. John Gloucester, thank you so much, sir, for joining us on 575 Ounces. Three unfit men trying to get a little lowdown on what the fitness situation is of the Indian cricket team. Uh, John, uh, talk about I, I, yourself, Arjun. Yeah. <laughs> Don't need to talk about it. Look at our faces. I think faces tell you everything straight up. But uh, Let's John, <laughs> John, I'm just going to tell you, uh, uh, drive right into it because uh, a couple of quotes have come in now, and uh, you know, resumption of cricket. Uh, I don't know. There isn't an exact date, but probably you could say we're closer to it now. And uh, there's a quote that, of course, came from R. Sridhar. And this one was, the challenge is to proceed in the right phases. Um, as a player, you can get excited when you play after 14 or 15 weeks. Uh, yeah. First phase, it will be low volume, low intensity, followed by moderate volume, moderate intensity. Then moderate volume, low intensity, high volume, moderate intensity. And then starts in high volume and high intensity. Basically, he's saying the sharpest minds for test cricket will probably take six weeks to get back into test match mode. Now, uh, for normal people like us, whose head this goes over, uh, could you get into a little specific, John? So, say if you're yeah, a batsman. Look, yeah, yeah, it's interesting how he's sort of, he, yeah, I get what he, where he's coming from and, and what he's saying there is, you know, in simple terms means that everything has to be graded. But you've also got to, you've also got to look at the two or three key things you've got to look at. So, that transition period from lockdown to play is critical because that's where you determine whether you get the players ready or not mm. and whether they're therefore going to get injured or not when they return to play. So it's a critical period. But it's dependent on two or three things. One of them is time. So it's very time dependent. So how much time do you actually have between when they return after lockdown to when the first matches are? I believe it's very role dependent because the preparation for a fast bowler is going to be completely different to that for a, for a batsman. And then it's format dependent. You've got to work out which format are they going back to? Are they going back to test cricket, ODI cricket, or T20 cricket? Because every single one has a different demand. Okay, but the, fortunately for us, what we do have available to us, and we've been collecting this data for the last three years at Rajasthan Rolls, and the Indian team has been doing it for the last couple of years, is we have their catapult GPS data for every single player from every single match. So what we now know is we know what their match fitness levels have to be okay so we now have raw data to say and hit, until they reach these match uh, these match profiles then they're not really fit to return to sport so we're mapping our return to sport criteria around that data because we know exactly how fast they run we know how much total distances they cover in matches we know how much time they spend in all the various speed bands 15 to 20 20 to 25 25 to 30 30 plus etc what their run-up speeds are, what their acceleration, deceleration rates are, what their you know, normative movement data looks like. All of that is mapped. So we now know if they're not prepared for the match situation, we, we now know that they're at risk of injury. So that data is available. So that's the beauty of it. So, uh, and for each individual, it's going to be different. So the time frames are going to be different for the fast bowlers. The time frames are going to be very different for an ODI, T20 versus test cricket. We know from this data that T20 cricket um, is a speed-based sport, okay? The, what we call the high-speed running velocity in T20 cricket is 30% greater than that of the, the running velocities in test cricket. So there's totally different preparations depending on the format that these guys are going back to. Uh, so, John, so what if uh, the onus was put on you from, from the health point of view and yep. it was put on you and say from, uh, from that perspective, given that <clears throat> where they're coming from, courtesy lockdown, which yep. format would be easiest to ease into so that the load on the body is not much? 
Look, I think um, all of them have their own sort of nuances or idiosyncrasies attached, you know, in that ODI, uh, T20 and ODI cricket, like I said, is much faster. The, the duration of time spent on the field is less, and therefore the total distances covered on the field is less. Uh, so for T20, it's about 8 to 10 kilometres of total distance covered on average. For ODI cricket, it's between about 12 and max 15. But in test cricket, it gets up over 20 kilometres total distance covered in a game. So therefore, there's a very endurance-dependent uh, one, which is test cricket, and then there's more speed and shorter duration, uh, what's called speed endurance for the for the shorter forms of the game. For me, I think I still think T20 is probably the the best one to uh, to work on, um, and easiest to work on because there will be a shorter time frame, particularly for the fast bowlers, because they're not going to have to front up and bowl 20 overs in a day's play straight up. They've only got to bowl maximum four overs and then cover the ground appropriately on the field. So it's probably T20, but the difference with T20 is the speed. But fortunately, speed is one of the things that you can gain very quickly, mm -hmm. but it's also one of the things that you lose quickest. Out of all your uh, strength, fitness, parameters, speed is the one that we lose first. If you're not training for speed, you lose, start losing speed after five days. Um, so, but you can gain speed quickly, um, but you can also lose it very quickly. So I think T20 is probably the easiest format to train for in terms of time. Um, but the biggest demand is from from the speed perspective, and that's quite difficult to train for. John, John, what about the, the mental aspect of this entire thing? You know, you've been uh, here. You are. You're probably world class athletes, uh, the best of what you do in terms of yeah. body execution, talent, everything. And suddenly, you've been put away at home, which you've never done before for two months. Yeah. And uh, to sort of then come back into that mode that you've been, uh, as as you know, we young kids like calling beast mode. It's thrown out a lot uh, nowadays in, uh, as far as fitness is concerned, Instagram and so on, these places. Then uh, how about the mental aspect of this entire thing? How do you work on that to get them back into that zone again? Yeah, I think, I think it was Paul Romer from Stanford Uni once said, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So uh, we, we've certainly not wasted this time. And one of the things we haven't wasted time on is developing the other side of the modern player's game. And that's the mental side. Because this is the side... We never really have the opportunity to dive into and explore and develop for our players. So this COVID-19 has actually given us a perfect opportunity to do that. Um, I, had a, I had a really interesting conversation with an Australian sports psychologist a couple of days ago. where He's terming this COVID-19 as sort of a bit of a reality check, but in, but in a good way. And what he meant by that was the term that he uses is he's using this as a, the term welcome to retirement. So he said, I'm starting to get these players to think about this is what life would be like after cricket. So now let's start developing, or if you're injured for a long period of time. So now is a perfect time to start thinking about both those scenarios. But at the same time, given that COVID-19 is testing us all mentally, this is a perfect time to develop strategies to overcome that, which is then going to help you in those pressure and fearful situations uh, uh, going forward in uh, post, post COVID. So fear is, is often a limiting factor to performance. Okay. For many, even the greatest, it's not always technical or skill that limits us. Okay. It's often fear. And I'm, and this is a perfect time to practice within these scenarios, decision-making in hostile, fearful, uncertain environments, because I can tell you right now, you're not going to get any more uh, hostile, fearful, uncertain environment than what's surrounding us at the moment. So use this opportunity. My, my message to the players is use this opportunity to develop and build some of these skills outside of your normal game that's going to benefit you in your game when we go back post-COVID-19. And we always talk about the one percenters. We always talk about, you know, what's going to make you better than the guy sitting next to you. Well, this is the opportunity to build the number one one percenter, which is the mental side of these guys' games. Develop patience, develop discipline, develop routine. A fantastic opportunity to work on nutrition on your nutrition. Okay, another super important, you know, uh, platform for the, for the modern day cricketer. If that's not right, the physical will never be right. So these are opportunities to learn and these are opportunities to grow. And that's the key messaging that I've been giving to our players. Yeah, I, 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 could, could I ask you a couple of questions, John? Uh, one, uh, you know, I'd love to know from you because I mean, just hearing you, one thing that you realize is that probably the person would be the quickest to get into a cricket field would be ideally a batsman of the T20 format, assuming, you know, just looking at that. So now, but what I'd like to know from you is 
uh, the toughest probably would be for a fast bowler playing test cricket. Now, uh, just Yep. Your guesstimate, and I know it's conjectured, something that you could look at. I mean, with all the years that you've put into it, how far would be a fast bowler right now from playing test cricket in terms of the three years of lockdown that he's had? Yeah, it, de it depends on what they've been able to do during this lockdown. Um, so that's going to vary from, from state to state, city to city, country to country. And we're seeing that hugely in that, you know, but for, for an Indian player in the normal constraints of the lockdown in a city, say Bombay, it's yeah. very, very different to say, you know, a Ben Stokes, for example, you know, at his place, he's got a, uh, the, the, the lockdowns there weren't so strict. They could get outside, they could still train. They've all got bigger gardens, bigger, you know, free air, free, free space to train. So if you're looking at say an Indian player, an Indian fast bowler yeah. uh, in Bombay uh, mm -hmm. over the last three months, there are severe limitations to his physical capability going forward. But this is also a very good opportunity to work on what we call the, you know, your foundation skills for the game. This is a great opportunity to work on things we never have time yeah. to work on. I mentioned about the mental before. This is an incredible opportunity to work on the foundations of the game, the core stability, the single leg stability, the plyometric side, the, you know, the, um, the, the coordination, the breathing, the balance, the you know, all the little things we never really work on, which which actually are the foundations to build to building speed and strength and power and all the other things on top of it. So I'm hoping, and and all of our guys have been given programs to really work hard on that, so that at least then that transition phase is better controlled and much safer for them, and the foundations built to then sort to to accelerate at a much uh, uh, you know at a much faster pace. So. Um, the fast bowler, going back to test cricket, from an Indian sort of, yeah. in the Indian context, I believe they're probably about eight weeks, uh, eight weeks or so at least away from uh, being safely uh, able to return. Because that's, that's, how, that's assuming that they've done their foundation work, okay? And they've been really good with their nutrition. They've managed to control their weight. Um, but we've got to look at other factors as well around, you know, bone density. Um, because things like lack of vitamin D, if they're not outside in the sunshine, um, uh, maybe a poor diet during this period, they're not getting what we call sufficient weight bearing or load bearing, which is what stimulates bone to turn over and be strong. So there are two or three key sort of intrinsic factors that have to be brought into this equation as well that will determine outcomes, physical outcomes for those fast bowlers and their, and their skeletal systems when they do go back to cricket. So they're going, to be, they're going to have to be monitored very, very closely. But again, fortunately, we have their data. We know what's expected of them, and we know what we need to do to get them there. But I think the process is going to be anywhere between about eight and ten weeks. Okay. So, so that's great. So eight to ten weeks, as you're saying, for, for a fast bowler to return to test cricket. Now, let me put you, uh, you know, in the shoes of the Rajasthan Royals, uh, you know, physiotherapist at the moment, you know, someone who's involved with them at this time. We are getting to hear that uh, maybe October may be the time that IPL may happen. Now, again, you know, these are just estimates uh, based on the news sources. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. all of us, I agree. So in, in that scenario, um, and let's take a look at, uh, again, uh, you know, I'm just giving you a sample of, let's say, an Indian fast bowler, an Indian condition to play T20 cricket. What's the minimum time that you'd require and you'd, You'd like to tell the organizers that I need the boys at this particular time for them to be ready, let's say, for an IPL in October. No, but also I'd like to add, sorry, one more thing. That uh, sure. current scenario, when you don't know the date, right? And uh, yeah. dates are being flown around. How are you then preparing for something? Because when you don't have an end date, it, you know, the yeah. complexities add more and more. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is one thing we've been talking to the athletes about, about the cricketers, is that you know, normally athletes have what we call a destination. There's often a destination for them to work towards. Whereas here, we still don't have that destination in most cases. Some other countries, yes, Australia and other countries. Um, and this is not just unique to our cricketers. This is unique to our Olympians and all the other people that I'm working with as well. But so there's no destination as such. Because normally when you have a destination, you then work back from that destination. Um, and then what we call periodize up to that performance date. So again, that's still very difficult. So, so therefore, motivation is going to be is a big thing. And we've had a number of players saying that, you know, I'm just not motivated. And, and, and that's completely normal. And I've said to them that given that you don't have this destination, lack of motivation or, you know, 
not having the desire to train on certain days is completely normal and listen to it. You know, it's your body's way of saying or your mind's way of saying that, you know, I need to be re-stimulated somewhere. So taking three or four days away from your training is not going to change any of your physical parameters. Or like I said, the first thing you lose if you're not training is speed. But that takes five days before it starts to go. General fitness is around 15 to 20 days. Strength is around 20 to 25 days, I think, roughly. So it doesn't matter if you're taking two or three days out to get this, you know, above the shoulders, to get this back in order. So then the physical can then sort of be, you know, kick-started again. So, um, so, so IPL, you know, what we're saying to our players is that, you know, we're, we're not giving dates because we don't know dates, but we're saying let's just keep the foundations in place. If you have the opportunity to do more, then we're encouraging you to do more. But at the same time, we're also taking them out. So after the first two months, they all worked really, really hard. Then we actually took them all away for two weeks. Nothing. Fast bowlers who were able to do some bowling and running, we actually said, don't do anything. Just pull back. Let's get everything else refreshed. Focus on some other creative things. Focus, focus on some hobbies. Focus on being creative in other areas of your life or in your house or your space or your domain. Um, and then we'll return to the physical bit later and start building up again. So we're going to have to go through these waves a little bit until we've got a more definitive time frame. But let's say we're assuming that it's October, you know, let's, let's just assume October, then we'll have to count back from that. And ideally, if October was the date, I'd, and knowing what they've been doing up till now, up till now, I still think I'd need probably four, at least four to six weeks with the guys to sort of be confident that when we hit the ground running in that first IPL match, that, that there's, there's, there's not going to be too much injury risk. So, you know, you know, our role is, you know, mitigating injury at any opportunity. So all our risk mitigation sort of criteria are in place. It's now just a matter of implementing them as we see fit once we know the time frame. Um, but the biggest part of that injury risk mitigator is this whole high-speed running um, uh, capability that the players must have for the modern game. So that is number one for me, speed. We work on speed first. You talk to the Stephen Joneses of the world, you talk to any of the, the you know, the best S&C and best sports scientists and biomechanists in the world. They all talk about laying this foundation of speed first because the modern game, particularly T20, is built around speed. There's, there's, you know, there's no way around that. So that is, that is critical for all our players. And that's the first thing that we're building once the foundations are in place. Jimmy, you got something to add there? Eh? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously we've, we've, we've covered so many bases. I'm just thinking about your, what you mentioned, John, about motivation. Obviously the motivation would be different for people who are playing for an IPL franchise as well as for the Indian team. And then there'll be the likes who, who may, be, may be part of an IPL franchise, but who actually see more playing time when they're playing for their domestic state teams. Would be right to say that perhaps their motivation would be perhaps at the least because once they leave the the environment which you created, let's say at Rajasthan Royals, and then they go back to their domestic structure where perhaps it is not as fine tuned. What about some some players who fall in that category? They're probably the players that we call they're the at risk group of players that we talk about because they're leaving a protected environment. But what I'm hoping to do is skill them enough with it and educate them enough to know. Um, the dangers around not doing certain things and trying to go back to, to play. So they're all, they're all educated on what the process is. They're all educated about what the basics are and what, needs, you know, what foundations need to be in place. And that's one thing that we pride ourselves certainly on at Rajasthan Royals is that we maintain a relationship with these players 12 months of the year. It's not just the two months around IPL. Every single one of those, we have a, you know, a communications log. Every two, within every two weeks, I'm communicating with every single player on that squad. So they know that they have a contact point that, that is uh, safe and secure and reliable, that if they have any issues or they want any information about exactly what you're talking about, return to play, safety, injury, wellness, nutrition, whatever it may be, mental health, whatever it may be, they do have a contact point that is consistent for them throughout the year. And that's, you know, I, I see that as our, what we call duty of care. Um, and, and again, if we look at all these players as assets, there's significant assets for us. Um, and not just financial assets. I mean, yes, they are given the context of the IPL and, and how world cricket is these days, but they're also assets as people. And my responsibility is to protect that asset for the franchise, protect the asset for the, the association or the club that they're going back to, 
protect that asset for their country if they're going back to uh, international cricket. But ultimately, for me, it's about protecting that asset and their long-term health outcomes. That is equally as important to me as the short-term uh, outcomes and, and performance as well. So it's all about education. It's all about having a relationship with that individual throughout the entire year. Uh, John, if I could just bring the conversation back uh, to the Indian team, and I'll just take you through a quote of Hardik Pandya, who, of course, uh, recovered from a back injury and was hoping to get back into some game time as far as international cricket is concerned. This is what he said on Crickbuzz with uh, Harsha Bhogle. He said, for me, test match cricket right now will be a challenge. If I was a proper test match player and I did not have the game that I had in bite ball cricket, I would still go and risk my back. I've played times, there are test matches and followed that after with the ODI and T20 series have come and I haven't done well. By the time the ODI and T20 comes, my body says I can only give you 50%. Uh, there was a situation where my back was only allowing me to perform 50% and that's when I started realising that I don't have to bowl full pace every ball. That's when I started bowling more slow balls in the World Cup. So if I bowled a total of 10 overs in the World Cup, uh, 4 overs out of that would be slower deliveries. Uh, and not just Hardik, uh, John, uh, you suppose, keeping in mind the situation you're coming out of, the fact I'm alluding to is the all-format player. Would you yeah. say the all-format player should be put on the side for right now till this transitional period, being till the end of the year is there? And so that, you know, you break it up with a lot more players coming in. And so, of course, the load in the body is a lot lesser then? Yeah, I think the most difficult one is the all-format player now post-COVID. Um, and particularly for someone like Hardik, because he still has to get over the mental hurdles of performance as well, given post-surgery, because he hasn't really played competitive international cricket right. since, his, uh, since his back surgery. So he still has another psychological hurdle to overcome. So there will always be that sort of, I wouldn't say reluctance, but that apprehension around returning to particular longer forms of the game given that he hasn't tested his body uh, even in the shorter forms of the game at an international level just yet. So there's always going to be that apprehension for him. It's only until you achieve those targets and achieve that without re-injuring that you then cross those, that, that, that mental hurdle and then push on to, into other forms. So the all-format player post-COVID-19 is probably going to be um, what we call most at risk, um, particularly if they're going straight from a test series. Like we said, you know, I think the England boys are going straight from a test series and then into a, into a shorter format series. And the preparation, because the numbers tell us, like I said, the GPS numbers tell us is very, very different. So what they may have to do is even during the test series, start introducing some components of the training that is appropriate for the shorter format of the game. And we've seen that happen before is that during the test series, they may start doing some more high-speed running efforts as, as additional training during the test series to ensure that they're adequately prepared and protected for what they're about to, to uh, subject their bodies to uh, post that in the shorter forms of the game. Because it's a completely different um, work scenario for those players. So I think that's, that's really important. And that's the job, you know, for the SNCs to look at you know, this is this whole idea of, of mapping ahead and seeing what's coming up. Are they adequately prepared? Are they meeting the numbers? You know, in, in test cricket, let's say, for example, he sprints that, uh, you know, his high sprint efforts in his test in the last two series would say 28 kilometres an hour. As long as he's meeting that for the, then he's okay for test cricket. But if his highest speed efforts in T20 cricket and ODI cricket is 34 kilometres an hour, he's not prepared. He's six kilometres down on preparation, so the potential for injury is still there. So until he meets those criteria, so that's what you'll work on those differences during the current series, if it's a test series, in order to be prepared for those new demands on the physical body um, uh, in the series after that. Just, just, just one more thing, John. Uh, I, I heard Shoy Bakhtar uh, saying right now, and this is a great time for cricket content, by the way. Everyone's yeah. on uh, social media and is chatting, and you know, people like us who were dying for quotes and uh, stuff coming in. Now we've got like so many of them, we, we, we can easily pick and choose. Okay, no, today we're going to play this, we're going to play that. So Shoy Bhaktar said in an interview with Sanjay Manjreka, he said, listen, I don't enjoy uh, fast bowlers of today. Because at my time, I used to come in, try to bowl a fast ball every single delivery. Yeah. As a result of that, I've got bad shoulders, I've got bad knees, I've got bad backs. And nowadays, uh, bowlers are being a little more cautious, is what he said. So like Hardik said right now, like if, there, if there's six deliveries, then a couple of slow deliveries will come in as well. So that the ease on the body is a lot more. Where do you stand on this from your, from your uh, point of view? 
uh, would you would you say like uh, are you fine with that that the bowler is not going in 100% because that's his job I, or look, breaking his job depends body on the is, format of the game I, I i think it depends on the format i mean t20 you probably can't you can't use that analogy because it's it's um or you can't use that example because you have to be creative in t20 cricket if you come in and bowl 150 k's an hour every single ball in t20 you'll get pumped so variety is, is different in forms of the game. But if you're an out-and-out fast bowler and you're playing test cricket, your job is to bowl as fast as possible for as many balls as possible because that's what you're employed to do. So, again, you talk to guys like Stephen Jones um, who are, you know, the best guys in the world at preparing fast bowlers to bowl fast. They will tell you exactly how to prepare a guy to do that exact job because there are specific routines in order to do that. Because at the end of the day, particularly in, in test cricket, that is your job. If you're picked to bowl 150 plus and you come in and bowl, you know, three or four balls at 150 and the next three or four balls at, at you know, 135, that's not your job. There's 100 other bowlers who can bowl 135. So your job, it, it, that, that's the job description, so to speak. You need to be prepared to adequately perform your job description. Your job description in T20 is very different. Your job description in T20 requires you to bowl slower balls, Yorkers, be smart, bounce, you know, slower ball bounces, whatever it may be. But your job description in, in, in test cricket for a traditional fast bowler up front, the, ir, irrespective of the wicket, is to come in and bowl fast, and you need to be prepared to do that. Mitch Johnson, I think, was probably... I think he did it brilliantly in that Ashes series in Australia where he just kept coming back and coming back. His first spell would be 150. His last spell of the day after 20 hours a day, he'd still be bowling 150. But that was built around a very new training program and a new nutrition program, everything that he put into place in order to do that. And if that's what your job is, then you are have, going to have to be very disciplined in other areas of your lifestyle and the way you prepare and take advice from the best people in the business in order to get your body to do it. And that's it. Simple. Also, I, I think you've got to take, uh, you know, comments by Hardik Pandya and a few others maybe in these times with a, with a pinch of salt. I, I say that because uh, while, you know, they do talk about uh, their fitness and the issues that will happen in their fitness because of bowling fast, you also got to realize a lot of them have made up their mind that test cricket probably is not the go-to format for them. And, and a lot of players are now falling in that category where, you know, they'd rather play the shorter formats than, than play the test cricket. So everything is then built around this narrative where, where you may hear a lot of fast bowlers. I'll give you another example of Mohammad Amir from Pakistan, you know, at such a young age has already decided that. So the whole narrative is built around fitness, but you also realize that in their head, they've realized that, you know, the glamour, the money and everything belongs in the shorter format. So, so you build a narrative whereby you say that, you know, it's physically not possible for me to perform in all formats and then try and play the format where you get the most out of. Yeah. And, you know, and, it's, and in, in this context, you're talking about Hardik Pandya, the, the, the all-rounder as well, yeah. you know, because he's also got a, a very, you know, unique batting uh, capability to fall back on as well. And he's a gun fielder. So he's not an out-and-out fast bowler. I, I would say his fast bowling is a value addition rather than being his primary skill set. So, you know, I believe he's probably as good a batsman as he is a bowler. So, so his, his, his example is, is, is slightly different to, a, you know, I don't know, a Shaw Bakhtar or Sean Tate or Brett Lee or, a, um, or Varun Aaron, for example, who's still probably in India's fastest bowler. Their job in the longer forms of the game is to run in a bowl flat out, you know. And, but Hardik Pandya also is to think, well, that's one of my jobs, but I've also got to front up and bat potentially for, you know, two or three hours. Um, as, a, as, a, as a middle order batsman and do a, uh, do a good job there as well. So his skill sets are sort of spread over two or three areas which, which he needs to focus on. And, and for you to focus 100% on being an absolute out and out fast bowler is almost all consuming. And then have to then be, you know, and that's why I take my hat off to someone like Jacques Callas. Jacques Callas, for the majority of his career, bowled 140 plus, opened the bowling, batted three, yeah. You know, 14,000 runs and 300 and something. So, you know, unbelievable. And, and we look back on that and think, well, hang on. That was almost superhuman yeah. given how hard you know it is now to front up every day and bowl 140 plus with a, with a new ball in your hand. So, yeah, I think he's an exception. Um, you know, is Hardik Tandia in the Jacques Callas mold yet? No, you know, not yet. And he's still got to prove himself 
not just from a numbers perspective, but a but a you know longevity perspective. Um, but but I think that it's a it's a damn hard job to bowl fast, and uh, and if you're trying to do that plus two or three other things as well, it's even harder. So uh, that's what I'm saying. You need the right advice from the right people, built from the ground up, with those people understanding your body type and training you specifically for your body type only. That's it. John, then would I, would I be right in saying or would I be jumping the gun and saying that we've seen uh, the back of the express all quality quicks? Because if you're a quality quick, you're playing pretty much all three formats. Mm-hmm. If you're playing all three formats, can you, be, can you afford to be that express quick like a Shoaib Akhtar or a Brett Lee used to be in today's time? Yeah, I think sadly, I think you're right. Um, because I think if you're an express quick, that's pretty much all you can do. Um, like I said, either that you've then got to adapt and, and, and spend a lot of time developing skill sets for the shorter forms of the game, which is slower balls, slow ball bounces, you know, all the other things. So it's taking away from your core skill. Um, and like I said, to stay bowling at 150 plus takes a lot of not just physical effort, but mental effort as well. Um, and, and you have to train very, very differently for that. Um, you know, I'd, I, 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 one of the things I would suggest that at some point, if you get the opportunity to talk to somebody who really does know the fast bowler inside out and how to prepare them, particularly for the different formats of the game now and the demands of the formats of the game, then, you know, someone like Stefan would be great value to you guys to sort of understand that, that at some level we can, there, there are two or three individuals in the world cricket who can still adapt but I'm not sure that all of them can because, again, physically to transfer from one format and, and the numbers, like I said, the GPS numbers tell us how hard it is to move over format because the demands are so different. So you're going from, from almost completely different energy systems that you're using in T20 to test cricket. So you need to look, therefore, at how you're fueling these guys. So your energy systems change, your fueling mechanisms change. They determine performance, they determine recovery, they determine inflammation, they determine um, uh, injury. So even right down to what these guys are being fueled will determine how fast they bowl. So there's so many sort of areas that now need to be covered specifically to bowl fast that if you're then, you know, one week playing T20 and doing that and then two weeks later playing test cricket and bowling 150 for 20 overs, it's almost, it's very, very difficult to do. If, if I could, yeah, yeah, Jamie, after you, go ahead. I just had one sort of slightly broader question. John, you've, you've been involved with cricketers and athletes from this part of the world for a long time, and you would have seen the change. And it's, it's a lot of it is, is down to the hard work by good men like you and your, and your peers. How, how have you seen the culture of fitness change with regards to, to, to Indian cricketers and South Asian cricketers? And to what, to what extent has the IPL had an impact on this because of the, like you mentioned, the intensity of the T20 game? the pressure of the, of the leagues, and as well as mingling with, with athletes and cricketers from, from different cultures. Uh, uh, sorry, John, just, just one more thing yeah. if I could add, that if you, if you let go of them, how quickly do they fall back on old habits? I.e., do you have a lens on them all 12 months then? Ideally, yeah, because you've got to show, you've got to prove to them that if you don't continue on this process, then the catch-up is so much harder to get back to where you were and what the expectation is from the team and your teammates and the and the management, it's so much harder to catch up again. You get left behind too quickly and, and the risk of injury is too high. So, so there's incentive enough to stay involved at some level throughout, you know, throughout the year, hence our involvement. But yeah, the, you know, for me, the most pleasing thing for me is to see where Indian cricket's gone, um, or all sport actually, has gone in terms of fitness and the emphasis that's placed on it. It's now non-negotiable. If you want to compete with the best in the world, then you've got to compete with them across every single parameter, not just skill. No one can compete with the subcontinent flyers on skill. We've known that. Technically, we saw that in Indian hockey. The Indian hockey story is a classic story. When it was purely a skill-based game, played on grass, where the speed was much slower and fitness wasn't such a big issue, they dominated world hockey for 50 years. Gold medals, Olympic gold medals, world championship. As soon as they moved hockey to AstroTurf and the speed doubled, Indian hockey fell by the wayside because it didn't become a skill game anymore. It became a fitness game and a speed game. And what fitness means, means that you, when you're fitter than the opposition, you give yourself the most in, in, crucial ingredient in sport, which is time, time to deliver your skill. So you don't need to be the most efficient skill 
and technical player in the world. If you've got time, then you've got time to execute your skill. So same thing in cricket. And one thing that I always said to the players was, you guys are so good, but you'll never be consistently good if, you don't, if we don't work on the fitness side. Because all that's holding you back at the moment and why we're not consistently winning and staying at the top is purely because of the, because of the fitness side. And it's, and it's no coincidence that India over the last three or four years are one of the fittest sides in the world. And we've seen that reflected in their performance across all formats of the game. So it's very pleasing to see that. But it takes two or three people to stand up, put their hand up and say, this is how it's going to be done. Okay, come hell or high water, this is how it's going to be done. And you've got to see the results. The results are there. So now that we've seen the results, there's even more incentive to, for it to play out. And, 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 and therefore, it makes my job a lot easier because I've got something to fall back on and say, well, if you don't, you know, the chances of, of competing now are, are so much less. You just can't compete on, on this stage, particularly in IPL. The speed, the intensity, um, and, and, and you can't hide. There's nowhere to hide in IPL anymore. There's nowhere to hide in world cricket anymore. And, that, and that's not just because of the cameras that are on you. You can't hide from the ball. You know, so, so I think there's incentive enough for these guys to, to embrace it from a much earlier age. And that's why we're trying to drill down into the association level and say, well, this is where it's got to start from. And even below that, even getting into the sports education level and saying, well, unless we start skilling these kids at this level with these skill sets, then it's very difficult for them to be able to compete once they're at the elite level, on, on the fitness front, that is. So I think it's almost, a, it's, we've got to look at them through the entire pyramid now and start drilling further back down that pyramid, capturing them younger, giving them the basic skill sets to succeed, and then letting them go from there. But it's, going to take, it's still going to take a lot of work, um, but we're certainly seeing you know, significant changes over you know, the last 15 years that I've been in India. Uh, so, so, John, I'm, I'm actually going to take you back to the fast bowlers because I had a follow-up on, on that because you were talking about, you know, when Arjun spoke about, uh, you know, fast bowlers not being able to play a lot of formats. And I want to talk particularly about two words that you have at Rajasthan Royals, uh, mainly because, you know, we are now facing a scenario where, let's say, for example, West Indies is going to England. You already have two teams. You know, you'll have to name a backup 11, which need to be ready in case there's something comes up. Also, you may have a scenario where you're playing multiple series, T20 tests. All I'm saying is that you'll have to increase your pool of bowlers and India may be looking to do that. Now, now my question is regard to the two words that you have at Rajasthan Royals, one in Jaydev, Vunan, cut highest yeah. wicket taker in, in Ranji Trophy the other uh, who's been on and off in the Indian team but you know hampered because of injury you mentioned him probably the quickest that we have in India in Varun Aran now if in case an opportunity opens up, which see, seems like because with multiple scores, do you think these two guys, seeing them in terms of their fitness, in terms of their skill level that you've seen, are, are ready to take that next step or, or return back to the Indian team? What have you made of them? Yeah, I think we've been, we're enormously blessed to have both those, and not just as players, but as people as well. They're, they're, they're both two wonderful people and, and, and you've also got to look at what they bring to a dressing room environment other than their cricket skill set. So they tick all the boxes on that side. Um, I still believe that Varun Aaron, um, I still believe he's probably the quickest player and bowler in the country when he's, when he's switched on. Um, we saw that in the last few games of the IPL last year. He's still got enormous amounts of skill um, and, and, and has a work ethic that is as good as anybody I've seen. And to bounce back from six or whatever, how many number stress fractures he's had to be where he is today and still bowling at 150 plus is unbelievable. So for sheer effort, um, he should be rewarded. The other one for sheer skill and sheer effort throughout mm -hmm. a grueling Ranji Trophy season. And I, and I still think anybody who can take 68 wickets or whatever it was in a Grand, Ranji Trophy season yeah season as a seam bowler on uh, particularly on a Raj in, in a wicket like Rajkot um, needs to be rewarded as well so there are two guys in that setup that I, I believe have much to offer Indian cricket at the international level and then if you look at the next layer down from them you still got guys like you know Ankur Rajputs and Kartik you know this new Kartik Tiagi uh, Akash Singh and these, these are super impressive kids super super impressive so I think what, it, what you'll see with the Indian team is, yes, you'll see them take a core squad and then, uh, and then another squad, like you said. Both will be playing or tr training uh, together um, and there will be a lot more uh, sort of bench swapping um, and that's 
just because of the way that the game's going to be played now. Um, and also because uh, we haven't had and won't have the period the, uh, of trans these transition periods that we would ideally love to, to have them fully prepared. So just to minimise injury risk, I think we're going to have to go with much larger squads. And, you know, they would definitely be two names, like you mentioned, JD and, and Byron Allen would be two, two names which would be very high on the list of those guys to be in and around that squad. And then, you know, there's an opportunity now for some of these young kids to put their hand up and say, look, we're ready as well. Uh, John, before... And look, that's part of our job. That's part of our job is to ensure... So I go into every one of these and think that potentially these guys could be playing in, in wherever for India in the near future. So that's part of our sort of preparation psyche as well for these guys at all times. Because I believe that anybody in our team at Rajasthan Royals at some point or another still has the skill set to play for their country. Uh, John, final question before we let you go. Uh, um... Where do you stand? Because if you talk about the Indian team of late, uh, like you mentioned, the team, the fitness levels have gone to another level. And, and part of that has been the clean and snatch phenomenon, which I like calling. Uh, a lot of the Indian players like doing a lot of clean and snatch workouts. And keeping in mind that you're at home, uh, would you have advised people to do clean and snatch given that if form is not right, then it has a direct impact on the back. And if there is no one to, of course, you know, monitor that, uh, would, you, would you reckon that people should not have been doing those exercises? Where do you stand on the clean and snatch, uh, given the amount of load it has on the back, as far as work? Um, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of risk involved, particularly if it's unsupervised, and particularly if those players haven't come from a history of lifting. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of danger in lifting that way, um, and uh, you need to be very careful. Plus, you also need to have the body type to suit it. Not everybody has a body type, and there are plenty of fast bowlers out there I know who should not be doing that type of lifting. Absolutely not, because they do not have the body type for it, particularly what we call the, the tendon-driven athlete. So the heavier you load, those, those sort of tendon-driven bowlers, the explosive springy type bowlers with weight, the slower they're going to bowl, because you're dampening their shock absorbers. Okay, so it's all about neurotyping and, and looking at their neurotypes, and, and, and again, this has to be looked at. So every single fast bowler has to be given an individualized program specific for their body type. Okay. And there's, yeah. And, and I would say at least 50% of those probably maybe not as maybe 40, 50% of those don't have the body type suited to be doing that type of lifting. And in the long term, will end up, they will end up bowling slower and have a greater risk of injury, particularly to the lower back. Um, because you've got to think about loading. It's all about loading. They go out and bowl and bowl and bowl, and then suddenly they, they break down while bowling, okay, with a stress rate. So we blame the bowling, okay? It's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like a guy, you know, having a heart attack while eating a pizza. We don't blame that one pizza for his heart attack. We blame the thousands of pizzas and Cokes and whatever he had before. Same with the fast bowler. It's not that action of bowling. He's been doing that for 20 years. Why would he suddenly break down because of that? It's often not that. It's the other things that are loading his skeletal system that has led to that straw breaking the camel's back while he's bowling. And this is where this loading outside of competition needs to be looked at. It's what we call cumulative loading on the skeletal system. And Patrick Farhart and myself and a few others are very, very particular about this and very big on this. Because it's that cumulative loading that we're often not aware of outside of their controlled system, which, which is bowling on the field and in the net, that is often undoing these fast bowlers in court and is a, the root cause of a lot of their skeletal injuries. So that needs to be looked at a, a, a much, much closer. And, and so I think that if there's anything that we'd be looking a lot more at over the next couple of years, it would be training specific to the individual body type. But then, John, John, how do you handle that situation? Because, say, uh, even Patrick or you are saying, look, the SNC, uh, there is, there's an SNC department as well, which is possibly saying, look, clean and snatch is good. You should go for it. But then you're saying, look, maybe if your know, body's not ready for it and you've not tuned your body from a very early age for it, it's not happening. So then that conflict of sort happens. Yeah. Uh, and that's then, always going to be the difficult thing. I fortunately work in, a, in an environment of roast and rolls where there's a great relationship with myself and Stefan Jones, who's the head of uh, fast bowling preparation and SNC, and then Noel Augustine, who's, who's our other head of SNC, um, so who are all very, very switched on about this stuff. You know, they both got degrees in biomechanics and sports science and 
you know, he's even got a physio degree actually. So, you know, we're very aware that, that um, these situations need to be assessed individually. So we're all on the same page, but in some circumstances, you're always going to have opposition to that because of the way that a certain trainer has been trained. But you've just got to go back and look at the history of the individual. And that will tell you more about how to train them than anything. Okay, so if something's already working, if they're already bowling, if a Joffre Archer is already bowling 155 k's an hour, or Sean Tate's already bowling 160 k's an hour, and he's never done weights in his life, ever, why would you suddenly start loading him up with weights? Yeah. Particularly non with someone like Joffre, who's a, what we call a tendon-driven athlete, and he would actually bowl slower as a result of that type of heavy lifting. Sean Tate said exactly the same thing to me when he first came. He said the only time he ever got injured was when he was asked to go in and start lifting heavyweights. He'd never lifted a weight in his life. He was bowling 161 k's an hour. He was then made to go and work out heavy weights in the gym. And from that point on, he said, John, I, only, I kept getting injured. You just have to look at the history of that individual and the way they've trained previously, map that against their, their, their bowling performances and stick to that plan. Anything else, guys, uh, before, before we let John go? No, nothing. The other thing, you, you uh, probably Sean didn't get enough of. We worked a lot with him in Crick Info. was good Indian prawn curries. You know, that was the fuel that he needed <laughs> to bowl <laughs> fast. As long as you do. Again, <laughs> you know, the thing about Sean is not only did he bowl 160 k's an hour, Sean gave so much off the field. You know, he's the guy that you would have in the team, even if he couldn't bowl, because of what he brings to the dugout. And that is, the best thing about Sean was what he brought to the dugout. If he wasn't playing, he was still an enormous asset to the energy of that team. And that's a huge part of selection in the modern day, you know, in the modern game is that it's not just about how good you are with your skill set. It's what else can you bring that's going to add value to that team. And, uh, you know, particularly in, 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 in terms of positive energy. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a big, big fan of Sean Tate, not just because he could buy 160 and knock people's heads off but because he uh, but because he was just an all round nice bloke uh, john just just one final thing has come to my mind right now because we've seen so many injuries to our fast bowlers there's just Preet who picked up an injury uh, sometime back few months back there's of course hardik we spoke about there's bhuvneshwar kumar who's been picking up injuries for a long time now consistently now when you see that from the outside how do you term it do you term it as a systemic failure that you know certain departments didn't come on board and that's where it happened or is it an ind- individual failure that, you know, it's just recurring over and over again? Look, I think it's, it's very hard to comment on that because I don't know their training protocols. I don't know their loads. I don't know their, I don't know their blood parameters. I don't know their nutrition profiles. I don't know their uh, uh, PHQ-9 testing protocol, profiles, you know, their mental health profile. You know, so many factors that factor into injury. You know, even things like dressing room environments factor into injury. You know, negative dressing room environments show higher, uh, show higher injury rates. You know, so there's so many other determining factors around what injures a fast bowler. But if it's consistent across a number of fast bowlers within the oh. same system, then at some point someone's going to put, their, put up their hand and say, okay, let's go back and look at the system. And I'm not saying there's faults in the individuals within that system. It may just be in the system itself. And, and it could be in something as simple as the communication. The reporting, you know, the reporting structure within that system. Is that functioning efficiently? Is the right messaging getting through to the coach from the S&C staff or the physio staff about what they should be doing in the nets or not? You know, does the physio know exactly, like I said before, what the S&C is doing with them in the gym in terms of loading? Does the coach know about that? You know, so, you know, so it could be a system failure. It could be an individual failure. Um, but given that I'm not on the inside and, and I'm, you know, but I've worked in enough systems to know that if something is consistently going wrong, you need to ask questions. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I think that, you know, all of us, um, uh, worry when we see, uh, you know, repetitions of the same injury that, that worries me more than anything. Um, because ideally you don't want to see the same injury being repeated. So you then need to go back and look at, you know, have I actually made the diagnosis correct in the first place? Have I, um, you know, ticked every box in their history? Have I made the right assessments around uh, return to sport criteria? 
Um, so there, there are a number of things that you need to be questioning yourself about as well. And, and the worst thing that I, you know, that I've always experienced as a sports physio is that, is that when they go back and they re-injure again, that's a, that potentially is a failure on my side because I obviously haven't ticked all the box. Look, injuries can happen and they can happen through freak circumstances. But if it's the same injury, then maybe I didn't tick every box or because of the pressures of the game and, you know, all the things that come on now, maybe there were, you know, I didn't take advantage of the fact that, that I needed to reassess and, and reevaluate something a little closer. But um, that's a really tough question. Um, but we need to then look at, you know, playing formats, um, how quickly they're transitioning from one playing format to another. Like I said, are they prepared adequately to go from test cricket straight into T20 cricket or vice versa? So, and it's very difficult to do that as a, as a, as a support staff group. Um, so there's always a risk. So then you need to sit down with the management and start talking about how you then map the FTP, you know, and say, well, it's impossible for us to play five T20s, then go straight the week later into a test series. That's asking way too much of these players. So maybe we need to have a closer relationship with the governing bodies and just say, look, we need to start mapping the FTP a little bit better in order to protect our players a little bit better as well. So I think there's a whole, you know, huge scenario here that we need to look at. Um, and and I, it's not going to be solved by just, you know, sounding out one individual or one specific system. I think we need to map it both from the bottom down, uh, from the bottom up and the top down and see where we find, see what we find in the middle. Uh, guys, anything else? Uh, no, nothing. The, the best absolutely learning, fascinating. Yeah, learning has been too, the, you know, beneath that formal top, a polo T-shirt that uh, Jamie is wearing is wearing shorts. That's been the one. <laughs> that, that's the new that was a great learning. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other one is what, what, what John said right at the start. Never let a good uh, crisis go waste. You know, yeah. that's yeah. something I'm going to remember. Absolutely. John, thank yeah. you so much uh, for your time. And uh, Pleasure. a long really conversation, but uh, feeling, feeling a lot fitter after this conversation at least. Uh, <laughs> post 35 <laughs> years, it didn't happen so much, but this 40-minute conversation made me feel a lot fitter. Thank you, you so much for your time. Catch and clean. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been great fun, guys. I really appreciate it. And, and good, fun, good conversation. Thank, thank, thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.